Hello, my name is Will Meshnig, and I'm a discussion group co coordinator and member of the Student Advisory Board here at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker will, with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. That's dole questions, no caps, no spaces. Please just ask one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind, and I again, just ask one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you, please turn off your cell phones. Today's program is presented in partnership with the Kosovo American Education Fund. I invite you to watch a short video from Zana Zakri Rudi, an alumna of this program. Hi, I'm Zana Rudi. I'm a Harvard Kennedy School graduate and part of Kosovo American Education Fund, 107 strong alumni base. KF is helping Kosovo by educating its youth. Most of us that have returned, we have been part of the development of Kosovo in one way or another. I served as Kosovo's ambassador to Panama, covering the entire region of Latin America and the Caribbean, while others have helped Kosovo, changed Kosovo for the better by establishing businesses. Through KF, I was given the opportunity to learn and to grow, but also be part of this excellent group of professionals committed to contributing to Kosovo's future. So take advantage of the opportunity through the Jim Jama Opportunity Fund and in the process, if you have any questions, please know that KF students, current and former, stand ready to help. And now, please join me in welcoming the director of the Dole Institute, Audrey Coleman. Thank you so much, Will. Great to see everyone this afternoon. Thanks again, Zana, for representing the Kosovo American Education Fund. It was a pleasure to work with you on our original program back in December 2021, and it's great to see you again. This is a really exciting day for the Dole Institute as we embark on our much anticipated series, uh, Building Democracy in the 21st Century, our discussion group series for the spring 2023. And these sessions will feature our spring 2023 Dole Fellow, Dr. Chendram Gashi. Dr. Gashi is currently an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Pristina. His numerous accomplishments include service as ambassador, to Kos of, ambassador of Kosovo to France from 2016 to 2021 and recognition with the, uh, recognition with the insignia of commandeur of the French Legion of Honor in 2022. He earned his master's degree at the University of Cambridge and PhD at the University of Chicago. Before I turn things over to Chendram, I wanna recognize a few contributors and partners. Discussion group programs are made possible by Newman's own foundation. And this spring series, as Will mentioned, is presented in partnership with the Kosovo American Education Fund at American Councils for International Education. And I wanna send special thanks to our colleague Ed Hamill at CAFE for his many contributions to our program development. Here at the Institute, I wanna thank Sarah Stacy and Amber Wood for all their work to making this series, ha series happen and here on campus, the KU Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies for their promotional partnership. Again, this spring is with our fall fellow, retired Washington editor of the Wall Street Journal, Jerry Seib, we are able to host our fellow in residence, enabling a truly transformative experience for the Dole Institute, the KU community, and beyond. Chendram will be here in Kansas for three weeks thanks to the JAMA Opportunity Fund. And thank you to the Dolph Simons Family Fund. We'll, we'll welcome Jerry back to campus for part two of our Building Democracy in the 21st Century series. Lastly, and this is really fun and, and such an honor, uh, in honor of Senator Dole during his centenary year and his advocacy for and friendship with the country of Kosovo, last month a group of Dole Institute representatives were honored to receive a proclamation from Kansas Governor Laura Kelly naming this Friday, February 17th, 2023, Kosovo Independence Day in Kansas. Acknowledging the 15th anniversary of Kosovo's Declaration of Independence 
and honoring the people of Kosovo and their struggle for freedom and democracy. Chendram, it's my privilege to be able to present to you this proclamation from Governor Laura Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. to introduce his distinguished guest and to bring, begin our program this afternoon. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. So uh, I'm delighted to be the uh, and I would like to start by thanking the Institute and thank you, Audrey, and all the, your team for the very wa warm welcome here in Kansas. It's, it's wonderful to be in Kansas. It's my first time in Kansas. Uh, so, uh, late Senator Dole, as you mentioned, was an American hero who embodied the values of freedom and democracy, but he was also a friend of Kosovo. So it is really a true honor for me to have this fellowship. On Friday, uh, it will be 15 years since uh, Kosovo's Declaration of Independence, which was strongly supported by the United States. So it is very fitting that uh, we discuss today about building democracy in the 21st century, focusing on Kosovo. Joining us to discuss is Dr. Palum Kelmendi, and uh, I will give a brief bio of Dr. Kelmendi, or Palum, as I've known Palum for a while, uh, Palum Kelmendi is an assistant professor of political science at Auburn University. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan's Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies and a pre-doctoral fellow at Harvard University's Whitherd Center for, uh, or Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Dr. Kelmendi's research focuses on international security, conflict resolution, and democratization. He has received research awards from the United States Institute of Peace, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Open Society Foundations, and Brown University. Dr. Kermandi serves as a board member for the Society for Albanian Studies and the Pristina Institute for Political Studies. He has received his PhD in political science from Brown University, an MPhil from University of Cambridge in Development Studies, and a BA in political science from the University of Chicago. So now you understand the connection. So we, we both went to the University of Chicago. So Palumba, I'm very happy to have you here. We're very happy to have you here. And, and I would like to uh, start uh, the discussion by, by maybe asking you to explain to us, because we have a diverse audience, where is Kosovo? <laughs> I'm sure this is a question that you have uh, you know, <laughs> had to answer when you were a student at the University of Chicago and elsewhere. Where is Kosovo? Well, uh, thank you, first of all, Chandram, uh, for that kind introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor and a joy to be here with you and to have this conversation, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to it as well. Yeah, um, students do, uh, and other friends, obviously, while studying in the US as well, always asked uh, about uh, the location, but also about what makes Kosovo unique. and. Uh, and uh, I think that I usually focus, people have a mental imagery of Kosovo as this society that went through war, right? Uh, a, a sad uh, uh, a story, but I like to uh, explain Kosovo uh, um, as a unlikely success story. And I say that for uh, uh, three reasons, the first one of which has to do with its location. Kosovo, as you can see, uh, on, uh, on the map uh, is at the heart of uh, the Balkan Peninsula, which is in the, uh, located in southeastern Europe. It's equidistant to uh, Rome, Vienna, and Istanbul, and uh, so uh, its history has been defined uh, by uh, sort of uh, different uh, empire projects throughout time, and uh, in that sense, Kosovo and its, uh, in its population uh, have uh, sort of had this unlikely survival story, first of all, uh, uh, throughout uh, different uh, uh, periods of history, uh, uh, both Roman Empire, subsequently 
the Ottoman Empire, obviously Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. Uh, the people of Kosovo, the majority pop uh, Albanian population of Kosovo has managed to retain uh, their identity, their culture, their language. Uh, and that survival story became even more intense during the 20th century, uh, given uh, Kosovo's position in the former Yugoslavia. So, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that. And the second sort of uh, um, unlikely success aspect of Kosovo's story has to do with its ability, its eventual ability to secure uh, uh, freedom and independence against sort of a much more powerful adversary, which was uh, uh, Serbia, and in a very difficult uh, uh, environment, and obviously with the help of uh, uh, Western uh, 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 intervention as well, and as you noted, the U.S. played a particularly important role there as well. So Kosovo is also a, a, a U.S. Uh, success story in a way. And the, the final uh, reason that makes Kosovo an unlikely success story, obviously there are others, but the one that I'd like to highlight uh, a lot is that it's also, uh, it's also an unlikely success story for state building and democracy, a society that emerged uh, out of war without uh, 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 previous experience with uh, democratic politics in uh, late 1990s, right, in, in the early on in the 21st century nevertheless managed to actually build the most vibrant, I argue, uh, democracy in the region, uh, even though its economic conditions, sociopolitical conditions, and historical conditions actually would have uh, 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 sort of make it seem that it would have the least likely success. And we'll talk about the sources of its democracy as well. So yeah, Kosovo is in uh, the heart of the Balkans and uh, uh, it's an unlikely success story that I think uh, people should uh, know more about. And it's also a uniquely American story as well. Great, so maybe just uh, one further question on the history. Because of course, as you all know, uh, the Balkans uh, is always fascinated with history and sometimes with too much history. Yeah. But nevertheless, um, uh, is the political entity called now Kosovo something that exists only recently, only as of 2008, 1999? What's, so what's, what's the history behind the yes, entity? Yes, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, the, the history part you mentioned, I, uh, there's often, uh, Winston Churchill is misquoted about saying that Balkans produces more history than it can consume. And uh, as we will talk later on, perhaps uh, towards the end of the 20th century, Kosovo uh, also did that uh, uh, as well. So as a particular entity uh, uh, with its own sort of uh, uh, identity, Kosovo has existed throughout these different periods of uh, uh, time that I talked about, including, for example, uh, during uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, there was this administrative unit that was called uh, the Kosovo Vilayet, which was uh, a part of the broader uh, Ottoman Empire. It's actually, incidentally, uh, also where uh, Mother Teresa was born uh, in the Kosovo Vilayet in uh, the capital Skopje, which then uh, used to be uh, the capital of the Kosovo Vilayet, and her parents were from prison as well. And then uh, there were different iterations with different uh, uh, borders uh, in subsequent uh, sort of periods of time, but uh, as an entity, as uh, a political, administrative, uh, and also sociocultural uh, entity, Kosovo has existed for uh, quite, a, uh, quite a long time, yes. Okay, so I, I want to switch gears for a moment. Um, so you will see a photo of uh, Senator Bob Dole in Pristina, Kosovo, in 1990, in August 1990. And this was the first senior official U.S. visit, uh, or uh, a visit by senior U.S. officials to Kosovo. Uh, so um, Senator Dole led a, a delegation where he encouraged, of course, democracy and freedom. Um, and f for the audience, again, I, I would like to recall that this was the period just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, as democracy was spreading around Central and Eastern Europe, a message of hope. In Yugoslavia, unfortunately, things were getting more complicated. And, uh, 
uh, you know, the United States at that time was uh, what is what some people call uh, a, a hyperpower. So, with a you know uh, a, a term that's that's uh, popularized in, in the nineties. So, um, I would like maybe Palom to uh, to tell us where were you? I mean, of course, you didn't welcome Senator Dole. You might, you, know, you were young. No, uh, but where were I you never in, had the pleasure to meet him. So yeah. where were you in the, in the, in the 90s, early 90s, and, and, and how was life in the 90s? Uh, yeah, so I was four years old, uh, four and a half years old, uh, <laughs> when the visit uh, uh, happened. Uh, so I don't have a lot of recollection from that time. But uh, my life was about to change substantially uh, shortly after uh, uh, that visit because things uh, unfortunately only turned out uh, uh, for the w w worse. Before I make that note, I'd just uh, like to uh, emphasize that uh, why was uh, 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 Bob Dole uh, there at the time? And I think that uh, Bob Dole, because of his personal experiences, uh, having fought in World War II, et cetera, uh, was perhaps more aware than uh, others about the acute need for a U.S. Uh, uh, role and leadership in Europe, even after the Soviet Union was falling and, uh, uh, you know, there were ideas even within the U.S. that maybe Europe should be on its own and uh, uh, it, the, that the U.S. role there would not be as needed. But I, uh, I think that uh, he sort of uh, realized that uh, for the vision of the U.S. Uh, to have a Europe whole, free, and at peace, which has been sort of like one of the strategic guiding principles of uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Europe, uh, there, there was a need for a U.S. role there, and uh, moreover, that the Balkans uh, uh, and the former Yugoslavia, uh, which was starting to unravel during that time, was a key piece of this larger puzzle of achieving uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, of achieving uh, a Europe uh, uh, whole, free, and at peace, and so uh, I think he recognized this earlier uh, than most, uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, that speaks to sort of like his vision and his role uh, uh, throughout the 1990s as well. Now, what had been happening in Kosovo prior to. Uh, uh, this visit was that Kosovo used to be an autonomous uh, entity within this broader uh, federation called uh, Yugoslavia, and its autonomy has been revoked. Uh, at that time, the majority Albanian population of Kosovo were experiencing uh, significant uh, repression. Uh, uh, people, uh, Albanian uh, uh, judges, which my father used to be, uh, at that time, and uh, other public servants, servants were fired from their uh, 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 jobs. Uh, 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 the education system was also uh, unraveled. Uh, uh, Albanian-speaking so, uh, education system was also uh, sort of like ejected from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 Kosovo. And so what happened uh, during that time was that, yes, as I said, Two years after uh, Bob Dole's visit, I would uh, 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 I would start uh, my education, my schooling at uh, uh, makeshift uh, uh, primary schools, right? Uh, the parallel system, etc., and also uh, uh, in very very dire sort of economic and uh, socio-political circumstances as a result of those uh, measures that uh, uh, Serbia was uh, uh, using during that time. Yeah. So um, that's the period when, uh, uh, in Kosovo, um, uh, we, we, we call it uh, the peaceful resistance. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is a movement that was led by uh, the first president of Kosovo, Ibrahim Rugova. And um, before coming here to Kansas, I met with uh, one of his closest advisors, uh, so uh, one of the closest advisors of, of the late um, Ibrahim Rugova. His name is uh, Dr. Alush Gashi, no relation to my, you know, half of Kosovo is a Gashi. Um, my and, wife uh, is a Gashi as well, yes. no relation. Yeah. Yeah. So that explains any problems um, we may have. So, and, uh, so he told me that Bob Dole was seen in Kosovo as a global leader in expanding freedom and someone that believed in American exceptionalism. 
So uh, how, how did that help? Uh, and and uh, could you tell us a bit more about Kosovo's uh, uh, resistance during that period? Yes, so um, the, the map here shows former Yugoslavia, which was a, a multi-ethnic uh, entity with uh, six republics and two additional highly autonomous uh, entities. And um, the former Yugoslavia had at least three different problems that led to its dissolution uh, uh, and uh, then sort of like subsequently that also uh, uh, created the need for the creation of the parallel institutions that you were talking about with Ibrahim Rugova. The, the first uh, problem of the former Yugoslavia was obviously the contradictions of its economic systems, which uh, economic system, uh, which uh, I, I can't go into too much detail uh, of. The second problem was that it was an authoritarian country, right? Uh, and that you had all of these different uh, ethnic groups with a uh, strong sense of identity and nationalism pulled together, some as a marriage of convenience, like uh, with the case of Slovenia and Croatia, and others through force, which was the case with uh, Albanians in Kosovo. And uh, the third problem of, uh, the third major problem of Yugoslavia was that it was used uh, uh, by uh, Serbia as sort of uh, an extension of its uh, strategic uh, aim, which is to be a, a regional uh, hegemon. Uh, and so uh, the Albanian population uh, in Kosovo during the former Yugoslavia experienced significant, uh, 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 significant pressures uh, pressures to leave the country, right? Uh, torture. I think the, in the 1980s, something around a quarter of the population at some point or another went through police interrogation, etc. The abrogation of its autonomy, as we called it. Uh, and so there was a strong need to, A, uh, maintain uh, the, the cult cultural integrity of the uh, Albanian population, and B, also uh, 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 strive for and achieve for independence. And the way uh, Dr. Rugova and uh, others did that was by creating a democracy within an autocracy, right? And creating uh, parallel institutions, democratic elections that were obviously not recognized by Serbia and Yugoslavia proper, uh, by uh, 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 creating a lot of uh, solidarity within the Kosovo Albanian population, both uh, in Kosovo and also in the diaspora as well. People uh, contributed money both within and outside to maintain the parallel education system with both, which both you and I uh, were a part of. And at the same time, trying to raise awareness about the humanitarian sort of uh, problems that Kosovo was facing abroad and seeking international uh, uh, intervention in the situation. The pictures that uh, uh, you show here on the slide, for example, include uh, women's uh, marches uh, during 1998, uh, right after a major massacre had happened during the war in Kosovo. Uh, they were organized by the Women's uh, Network uh, 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 of Kosovo, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the middle one is, uh, I think, uh, held actually during 8th of March, which is the International Women's Day. One of the reasons why I suggested that you uh, include this picture, Chandram, is because if you look uh, close uh, in the left-hand corner of the, uh, of the middle picture, you can see the former director of uh, the primary school that we went to together, although we did not know each other uh, back then as well. So there was, uh, there was uh, a lot of civil society uh, organization trying to attract attention uh, of the international community about the plight of the uh, uh, people of Kosovo during that time and uh, as well as uh, a lot of solidarity and uh, institution building during that time. Yes, and, uh, and, and actually it's, uh, it's uh, interesting to recall those, uh, those moments. Uh, so first, uh, the world is small and Kosovo is smaller, so you, of course we went to the same uh, school. Um, but the we second, did not know each other. We did not, yeah, but, uh, but uh, at that time uh, what had happened was, uh, I can share, of course, my family's stories as well, my father, who was a CEO, uh, uh, 
president of a, of a public uh, company. Suddenly, you know, he was, he was not allowed to work. My mother uh, was teaching Albanian at a school. She was not paid because she was teaching kids in Albanian. And of course, uh, the only television that existed was shut down, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so the pressure was real, but, uh, but uh, we, you know, we managed to organize ourselves and uh, we were inspired uh, and supported by, by the United States in, uh, in this endeavor. So uh, uh, since I mentioned the United States and since we are in the US, uh, maybe uh, I would like to turn our focus now on uh, the uh, Albanian American or Kosovar American diaspora and uh, the role that it played in uh, building democracy in Kosovo. And at this stage, you know, we're talking about actually getting Kosovo free. So building freedom and then democracy. Yeah, so um, it's hard uh, to talk about these events without going back too much in history, but uh, it's important uh, uh, to note that one of the struggles for uh, Kosovo during this time was to attract international attention to its plight. And unfortunately, international attention is usually focused when there is uh, uh, armed conflict. Kosovo had chosen a nonviolent, peaceful resistance during the uh, early 1990s, while the rest of uh, uh, former Yugoslavia was in flames and engulfed by war. And so the focus of the international community for the most part, besides some uh, important uh, uh, actors such as Bob Dole, was primarily in uh, the conflicts in Bosnia and in Croatia, etc. And so what the Albanian American uh, community did uh, particularly effectively was not only to help with a uh, with a civil society organization uh, uh, back uh, in Kosovo, but to also raise awareness about uh, the the plight of the community outside. The first picture uh, uh, that you can see on uh, on the slide is uh, an, a protest that is organized by the Albanian American community uh, in 1995. Uh, during the Dayton peace uh, uh, talks uh, and asking for Kosovo to be included in uh, uh, in uh, those talks. Unfortunately, it was not. So the, uh, those were the talks, for the audience, those were the talks on Bosnia. On Bosnia, exactly. So those were the talks on Bosnia, Croatia, and uh, Serbia were part uh, uh, of these talks to solve the, the, the bloody uh, conflict that had uh, sort of... Uh, uh, been there uh, uh, in the first half of the 1990s, the Albanian American community was asking that the Kosovo issue be included in those talks. It it, it was not, uh, but they kept up uh, 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 their uh, pressure. They kept protesting again. the the middle uh, The middle picture there shows a protest uh, that was held in March 1998. Uh, when those previous protests in Kosovo were occurring as well. Uh, uh, raising awareness about the, the massacres that were going on in Kosovo uh, 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 during uh, 1998 uh, and earlier as well, and seeking for a, a more international commitment and intervention in the conflict. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, I think they uh, did manage to uh, uh, influence uh, more and more uh, uh, policymakers to do something about that. And one of the reasons why they were successful, I think, was in part because uh, the cause that they were uh, promoting was a cause for human rights, right? It was a cause for freedom. It was a cause for uh, 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 self-determination as well, something that resonates with others and something that particularly resonates uh, uh, in the United States, which is sort of like the ideational home of a lot of these uh, 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 of a lot of these concepts, and uh, that uh, uh, that led to an, uh, uh, an increased uh, role of the U.S. in the conflict, which eventually ended up helping it solve. So we will come to the U.S. Kosovo relations um, uh, a bit later. Uh, now, uh, as, as you can see, we're going chronologically uh, through the recent history of, of Kosovo, and so. You know, a mathematician tries to be structured sometimes, and uh, and <laughs> but uh, so now it's the the most difficult chapter. It's it's the chapter of war. Um, so um, uh, we have seen the pictures of the war refugees in, in Kosovo. Some of you may have seen them. Um, some other people have been in that position 
uh, so again, where were you during this period? Um, I was uh, uh, I was a refugee as well. Uh, um, eventually, uh, uh, in uh, uh, in March and April of 1999, a lot of uh, uh, the Kosovo Albanian population uh, was ethnically cleansed uh, uh, from the area and through various mechanism mechanisms. Uh, the picture that you can see there uh, shows uh, uh, Kosovo Albanian refugees uh, leaving Kosovo uh, towards Macedonia. That was uh, where I ended up uh, as a uh, refugee as well. Um, and uh, it was a particularly dark moment of uh, uh, Kosovo's history, obviously. Uh, but it was also a moment, at least for me, as, uh, as a young person back then, of uh, hope and optimism in uh, humanity too, because at this very dark moment in history, you also saw so much uh, uh, aid in refugee camps, people from all over the world, uh, particularly from uh, uh, the West and the United States, uh, uh, aiding in different ways, right? Uh, uh, aid packages, uh, aid workers, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, that gives you a lot of hope and a lot of faith in humanity as well. And I think that that's also uh, an element that I took uh, uh, away from it. Obviously, uh, you know, there were not so pleasant uh, uh, experiences during this time as well. I remember uh, when I started uh, doing uh, fieldwork research much later on as a PhD student, I had to travel a lot back and forth between Kosovo and Macedonia because my research involved uh, 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 Macedonia as well, and my mom once asked me, "How do you feel when you uh, when you're traveling the border?" You know, because we were uh, stuck I in uh, in the border for quite a, a few days. The, the buffer it, zone between the buffer two, zone, yes, yes uh, between Kosovo and Macedonia. Macedonia initially would not let the uh, uh, it stopped sort of allowing some people, uh, a lot of people in, and then, you know, eventually that was uh, figured out. So my mom was like, how do you feel about it? And it's, uh, it's interesting, but uh, young people uh, uh, also maybe do not internalize those things as much, and you're constantly looking forward. And uh, I remember asking her, uh, puzzled, what do you mean? You know, I'm going to, uh, to do my work. I'm interested in that. And then, uh, obviously, for her, it's an entirely different experience, uh, you know, as, uh, as a mom of three young children, uh, worried about her uh, family's safety, et cetera. That was uh, a different experience altogether. But, uh, yeah. That's very interesting. So uh, I've known Palum for a while, but I actually I didn't know that he was, uh, I was also a war refugee in, yeah. in now it's called North Macedonia. Um, and, uh, and, there's a way of dealing with the past sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes you just block it. And, you know, I've actually, you know, I travel frequently and I, I've never been to the camp which, uh, yeah. which uh, you know, uh, uh, housed, uh, hosted the, uh, the ethnic Albanian refugees and we were also stopped at the border and we spent three days, you know, because we were expelled from uh, Serbian uh, troops uh, from Kosovo. Uh, and then uh, we were not allowed to enter uh, um, uh, at that point the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia because they were afraid that uh, the large numbers would destabilize their ethnic composition. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, so I spent three days uh, with my family, uh, and uh, and eventually after international pressure the doors were you know opened and we we went to a to a refugee camp where uh, I met a French colonel, which explains why much later, actually, I started a relationship with, uh, with France. So, um, so the thing is, we have so many of these individual stories in Kosovo. Our stories, of course, is one which is a bit more optimistic because, you know, we survived yes. and we're here. Uh, and sadly, there were many people who lost their lives. Um, so um, th this war uh, ended with the NATO intervention, uh, and the, n that means with the US-led NATO intervention. Uh, could you tell us uh, what, what was the reaction in the US at that point? Uh, was this something that NATO was really pushing for? Because, you know, people who look at these uh, chapters of history, they, they, they uh, have a, sometimes a tendency of 
of uh, comparing Kosovo to the intervention in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Could you clarify that for us? What, what, you know, why are they different, if they are different? Yeah. Um, so Kosovo was a purely humanitarian intervention, right? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the key uh, element that distinguishes it from a, a lot of uh, other uh, interventions. And uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind when we, uh, when we, when we make uh, different comparisons. Uh, uh, Diplomacy, the NATO intervention in Kosovo it was also a form of what we call coercive diplomacy, right? Uh, diplomacy had run its course. There's been, there had been several attempts to make uh, Milosevic and Serbia try to stop uh, its, uh, uh, its war in Kosovo, try to stop the massacres, etc. cetera. And that when those, only when those attempts were highly unsuccessful, right, uh, did the coercive part take place. Uh, and that was uh, primarily aerial bombing of uh, uh, Serbian military targets, both in Kosovo and Serbia proper, uh, which lasted uh, uh, for more than two months and eventually uh, led to the Serbian uh, forces withdrawing from Kosovo. So the humanitarian aspect uh, is an important element uh, uh, to keep in mind. Um, but you know there were other uh, uh, there were other important sort of factors that defined uh, Kosovo's uh, 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 the defined NATO's intervention in Kosovo. Obviously, the U.S. was at the height of its uh, uh, power. It was sort of like still experiencing the unipolar moment, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that allowed for this type of international uh, humanitarian effort that uh, you know perhaps you know during periods such as the Cold War may, might have not been possible. And uh, the other important thing uh, to note is that it was, uh, the, the intervention was uh, highly uh, supported by the American public as well. I mean, the plight of Kosovo uh, uh, captured the moral imagination of people uh, uh, for all the different reasons that I mentioned, one of which is that, uh, you know, here was a society that had tried to survive for a very uh, long period of time, going through uh, 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 brutal periods of history, and you know, uh, had tried and exhausted the nonviolent option for uh, uh, freedom and independence as well, and so that's an important uh, uh, aspect uh, to keep uh, to keep in mind uh, too for uh, for uh, NATO's intervention in Kosovo for sure. I would just like to add that uh, the reason why maybe people make some of those parallels have to do with the fact that NATO's intervention in Kosovo also exposed the limits of uh, a complete international uh, multilateralism, uh, especially via the UN, limits that are even sort of like laid bare entirely now with the conflict of, in, in Ukraine. And that is to say that, you know, even when there's a pretty strong case to make for uh, humanitarian intervention, which was the case uh, with Kosovo, the UN Security Council could not act because uh, of the Russian veto power there, right? Now we have the same problem in a different context, uh, uh, obviously in a much more complicated context in Ukraine as well, but so, NATO's intervention in Kosovo also uh, exposed uh, uh, the limit of, uh, of uh, uh, um, you know, UN diplomacy in that regard. But it was a multilateral effort nevertheless. You know, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, the US did not do this uh, on its own. Actually, you know, there's an argument to be made that countries like Great Britain maybe pushed for it uh, even more so, right? And uh, this, it was a, a broader uh, uh, alliance that did this. And I think it's, uh, you know, and the NATO intervention in Kosovo then raised serious debates about, right, the uh, norms of uh, humanitarian intervention, responsibility to protect, you know, the, the tension between, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, these, uh, these different norms as well. Uh, and uh, uh, debates that unfortunately have not been entirely resolved, uh, uh, but uh, happy to talk about that later. Yes, and I think there was a, a very unique uh, set of circumstances because you had uh, a former Yugoslavia that had disintegrated already, and, uh, and uh, one thing that, uh, that played a role uh, was also uh, the war in Bosnia and also in Croatia, but especially yeah. in Bosnia. So diplomats involved in the 
in the peace talks that were organized in Rambouillet in, 19, in France in 1999, um, they, uh, they have shared this publicly, they have shared this with me, that, you know, um, the Serbian delegation, the Yugoslav delegation at that point, uh, they did everything to not be engaged in the peace talks. So they did not want a deal. And, uh, and so it was difficult for Western diplomats to justify why action is not being taken after the genocide in Srebrenica and the massacres in, in Bosnia. So I think this, in a sense, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but the, the lessons from Bosnia uh, were taken into account and they were helpful to address uh, Kosovo a bit earlier than, you know, than it would have done, it would have happened otherwise. I, don't, I mean, I think that's, uh, uh, but there's an element that we neglected in this, uh, uh, we, we, we spoke about the, the peaceful resistance, we spoke about the aerial bombing, but we did not speak about the armed struggle yep. of Kosovars themselves. So um, who were these Kosovars who took up the arms and, and believed that they could you know, oppose a mighty uh, country uh, in order to defend uh, their freedom? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, the... Kosovo Liberation Army emerged as a grassroots uh, organization in response to the failure of the nonviolent uh, resistance movements to at attract the kind of international uh, intervention uh, that would secure more human rights uh, and also independence for Kosovo, especially after uh, uh, the failed uh, 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 sort of the, the international community's failure to incorporate Kosovo in uh, uh, the Dayton Peace Accords. Uh, uh, that really provided a huge blow for uh, the nonviolent uh, peaceful movement uh, uh, because its entire sort of like strategic goal had been to attract more international attention to Kosovo's flight and it was completely neglected. So you had uh, different groups throughout Kosovo uh, uh, in response oftentimes to the casual terror that uh, uh, young men in particular uh, 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 were experiencing by the Serbian police on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, organized uh, uh, initially in small bands, and then as the, as the uh, uh, Serbian uh, uh, response to uh, uh, this movement sort of like became much more uh, uh, aggressive and also uh, uh, focused on uh, civilians, right? that uh, became a, a complete sort of like national movement by uh, the end of 1998 and beginning of 1999 as well, so. Okay, so now we're in June 1999. The war has ended. Um, you have NATO-led uh, troops called K4 uh, that entered Kosovo. The Serbian Yugoslav troops, they withdrew from Kosovo. There is a UN resolution, 1244, passed at the Security Council that, uh, that um, started uh, an administration uh, that uh, was led first by a Brazilian, then by a, a Frenchman. Uh, so they appointed someone who was like the, the king of Kosovo, the, the, the SRSG, like the yeah. special representative of the Secretary General, yes. who had vast powers. So, you know, a country that is emerging from the war, first they had to rebuild everything, you know, people, you know, lost, uh, uh, their loved ones, but also over a hundred thousand uh, houses were destroyed in a in a country that has you know less than two million people. And then and then you know uh, of course we had to t start talking about democracy as well. So uh, you know how was that built? Uh, how did democracy in Kosovo function just after you know uh, the war and and, and the years uh, after that? Yeah, so you mentioned the UN peacekeeping mission that was uh, uh, created uh, after uh, the war in Kosovo. And one of its goals, in addition to uh, bringing peace and uh, justice, uh, was to also build uh, democracy in uh, uh, Kosovo. And obviously, building democracy in societies that recently emerged from war, where there's a lot of polarization, not a lot of experience with uh, elections, etc., is generally hard. Uh, it's even harder when, you know, there's widespread poverty and uh, destruction and uh, uh, resentment of all kinds as well. Uh, uh, but at the same time, as I uh, mentioned, uh, 
during the 1990s, during the nonviolent peaceful movement, there was a lot of uh, 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 civil society organizations in Kosovo that were primarily in the human rights uh, uh, area and that had some experience, especially with civic engagement, that made uh, uh, Kosovo a little bit of an easier uh, uh, place to, uh, to uh, establish a, a proper democracy. The international community in 1999 had learned from uh, some of its uh, earlier mistakes. Uh, the elections were uh, uh, held a little bit longer than, uh, a little bit later than maybe people would have wanted, right? Like, uh, and it's actually, imp it turns out that it's important not to hold elections right after uh, the war, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you want to have some some rule of law uh, before the elections were held. Uh, so the national elections in Kosovo were held in 2001, and prior to that we had municipal elections which tend to be a little bit less polarizing, et cetera, and that also contributed to uh, this experience. As I mentioned, uh, during the uh, 1990s, Kosovo had, uh, uh, the Kosovo Albanian population had built some experience with organizing parallel elections too, which, uh, which helped, uh, and so even though from the outside, Kosovo looks like a very unlikely candidate for democratization, especially compared to uh, uh, you know, some of the other countries in the region which were more economically developed, had more of an experience with uh, 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 state building as well. Uh, through a combination of these fortunate factors, including the role of the international uh, community and you, you know, international uh, aid organizations such as USAID, played an important role here as well. You know, they, uh, they did training, democratic training for parties, right? Training for um, uh, election observers, et cetera. You see in the, in the photos uh, here uh, that OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, helped organize, uh, organize the, the first couple of elections in Kosovo as well. And so that laid the grand groundwork for what in my opinion, uh, uh, is uh, the most vibrant uh, uh, democracy in uh, the Western Balkans nowadays. Yes, and uh, so in the 90s, actually, I'll just uh, go back a little, uh, before the war and uh, when Kosovo was in a, in a very difficult situation, uh, there was this, uh, this phrase that some Kosovars with irony would say, uh, see you in uh, a free and independent Kosovo. And when they would say that, it was it, it meant that you know they they will never see you again. But actually, in reality, um, it meant that there's a there's a hope that uh, that will be achieved. And so, you know, free Kosovo is free. Uh, we're building democracy, but Kosovo is not independent yet. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, could you walk us through that process? How did Kosovo eventually become independent? Did it just happen like that? And one day the leader said. Voila, we're independent. No, unfortunately, uh, it, it, it was a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that, and occasionally uh, uh, also very frustrating for the people of Kosovo as well. So uh, the UN mission in Kosovo and its status uh, was uh, supposed, uh, its final status was supposed to be resolved uh, within a few years. It uh, took a little bit longer again because of the inability of diplomacy uh, and Western uh, diplomacy in particular to convince uh, Serbia to uh, come to some sort of uh, uh, an ag mutually accepted agreement by both parties. Uh, uh, so during this time between 1999 and 2007, there were serious rounds of uh, 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 talks involving the international community, uh, uh, the institutions of uh, Kosovo and uh, the Serbian government as well that culminated with the Vienna talks uh, um, uh, in 2006 and 2007, uh, uh, I believe. And, uh, uh, and uh, but unfortunately, yet again, right, same as in uh, uh, with the Rambouillet peace talks in 1999, uh, Serbia uh, was not willing to uh, bulge, and eventually Kosovo had to unilaterally declare independence uh, in 2008, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that sort of unilateral declaration, however, was uh, done in coordination with uh, the U.S. and other uh, uh, 
uh, Western uh, powers and allies throughout the world, and now Kosovo is recognized by the vast majority of countries uh, uh, in uh, uh, the international system, though unfortunately not by all of them, uh, including not by Russia, as uh, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Or uh, China. Or China, yeah. Yes, but there are also five uh, EU countries that yes. haven't recognized Kosovo, and, and they, that position actually impedes the uh, ability of the EU to uh, help the, the, the region at the moment. Uh, uh, so in 2008, uh, after that um, uh, Declaration of Independence, Serbia took initiative to uh, uh, seize the International Court of Justice to demand whether or not Kosovo's Declaration of Independence was was in uh, compliance with international law, and the answer was received in, in July tw 20, uh, 2010, and, uh, and so the answer was yes. But after that, of course, uh, um, uh, the answer they, was that it did not uh, violate. Yeah, it did not. Yeah, yeah, sorry. The answer was that it did not violate. Uh, I apologize. So, uh, but then again, unfortunately, the leadership in Belgrade cried. Uh, uh, you know, Wolf, and they said, uh, well, but they did not say whether or not Kosovo had the right to be independent. They, they only said the declaration was in accordance, but of course, uh, I mean, the question was put by, by the by Serbian Soviet leadership yeah. at that point. Um, so I want to stress, nevertheless, the quality of democracy in Kosovo. Um, you mentioned that Kosovo is a vibrant democracy earlier. Uh, uh, how, how does it do compared to the other uh, countries in the region? Yeah, so Obviously, measuring and comparing democracy, and this is where I get into more of the technical, academic -y, uh, uh, stuff that maybe uh, people are not as interested in as uh, those of us in academia, can be uh, hard, and there are different types of metrics, some of which are more subjective than others. Uh, I've prepared a slide here that shows uh, where Kosovo's democracy is uh, in the year 2021 compared to the other countries uh, in uh, the region. And the metrics uh, uh, include sort of the liberal democracy index and the electoral democracy index that are prepared by the Varieties for, of Democracy Project, which in my opinion and most of, uh, the opinion of most scholars of democracy is probably the most objective, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, way of measuring uh, uh, democracy. It measures democracy along more than 70 different uh, vectors using uh, experts from uh, uh, different uh, uh, places, uh, uh, t tens of thousands of, uh, thousands of experts, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And so, as you can see here, this is very interesting, I think, and uh, very uh, important to note, on both, uh, the both the electoral democracy index, which measures things like whether the elections are free and fair, whether uh, uh, you know there's civic free uh, civic engagement, right? Whether there's free speech, etc., uh, uh, and also on the liberal democracy index, which measures even things like uh, separation of powers, right? Kosovo uh, 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 scores higher than uh, uh, all of the other countries in the Western Balkans, and uh, uh, it's considered a proper electoral democracy. And there's some. Uh, countries there that are not uh, electoral democracies at are all, and one of them is our usual suspect, uh, 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 Serbia. Um, uh, unfortunately, right, because it's, uh, it's a big problem to uh, have neighbors who uh, don't recognize your right to exist, uh, uh, who don't, uh, uh, who have sort of uh, uh, hegemonic uh, Tendon, hegemonic aspirations for the region altogether, and it's obviously sad also for democracy not to be spread uh, throughout the region too. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, on all sorts of uh, elements, uh, right? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of association, uh, 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 free and fair elections, uh, uh, rule of law, and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, also separation of powers, uh, Kosovo does fairly well and uh, for the vast majority of those elements better than most of the other countries in the region. And, uh, and also maybe there's one element that, uh, I, I, and I don't really mean to be ironic here, is that uh, uh, handing over you know, power to, yes. uh, this has happened in Kosovo several times, has yeah. been 
po rotation of power. Yes. Rotation of power, it's uh, it's it's essential, and uh, yeah. and so we've seen that in in Kosovo. Um, so uh, maybe one uh, last question, because we started this by saying where is Kosovo, and uh, then I think uh, the last question should be, why should anyone go to Kosovo? <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I'm going to go back, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, so will I. Uh, um, why should people uh, go to Kosovo? Well, in addition to its rich uh, uh, and complicated history, right, uh, modern-day Kosovo also offers all sorts of uh, other reasons why uh, one would go there, particularly young people. We have a very uh, exciting cultural life there. Uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of artists that emerged uh, uh, after uh, sort of like the war was over, some of whom were, have been inspired in different ways and forms uh, uh, through uh, their wartime experiences that have been prolific in creation of uh, 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 art. There's different sorts of festivals uh, for those who are uh, music lovers, one of which is uh, the, the famous Sunny Hill Festival that is organized by Dua Lipa, who uh, hails from Kosovo as well. I'm kind of old enough to have listened to the music that her dad produced, <laughs> but I'm sure the students here are more interested in uh, her music, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's a good reason. To, it, it's, a, it's a lovely small country, right, the size of uh, Delaware, mountainous terrain, good ski slopes as well, and uh, 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 and people of, are welcoming, like in Kansas. Are very welcoming, <laughs> like in and Kansas. Yes. Also, <laughs> I, if you happen to be American and listening to uh, uh, this as well, which I'm sure most of you are, then they're also very pro-American, as you can imagine. It's uh, one of the most pro-American country in the world, and uh, so it's a particularly good, I think, experience for uh, American visitors to. Great, so I had a question regarding U.S.-Kosovo relations, but I hope that somebody will ask that. Uh, because uh, now is the moment when uh, we uh, will take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. And uh, please ask just one brief question. Uh, Please phrase your questions with this in mind and just ask one brief question, please. So, questions? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you both for being here today. Um, my question is, uh, it's particularly interesting that Kosovo developed during the 21st century, and you mentioned some of them, like a slow kind of rollout of democratization. What are some of the hurdles that Kosovo managed to avoid by using other um, democracies as, as an example. Thank you. Um, that's, that, that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very good question. And um, I think that, um, so there were a few, right? Having international observers actually helps a lot and having uh, external, uh, uh, elements in the organization of uh, uh, post-war elections is uh, particularly important. Um, I think that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why um, democracy worked well in a context like Kosovo, that's not necessarily, uh, that might not necessarily be the need of or uh, the case for in uh, more developed uh, uh, context is uh, also the fact that uh, the international community uh, pushed strongly to have uh, unity governments uh, uh, where uh, all the major parties partook in governance, at least initially, right, to sort of weaken uh, polar polarization uh, uh, between the different parties, and I think that was healthy for uh, a post-conflict uh, post society. Now, Kosovo did not learn that from the U.S. because obviously the U.S. is a, a different type of political system. Uh, uh, by two-party system uh, does not really uh, 
uh, lend itself to that kind of uh, coalition sort of governments, but uh, you know there are examples in uh, Germany and elsewhere uh, that do. But I think the other thing that uh, Kosovo learned, and it did so from the U.S., uh, in part because the U.S. pushed for it so much, is the importance of civil society in, uh, in uh, building a democracy, right? The importance of uh, civic activism, of uh, uh, monitoring uh, government uh, uh, and making it more transparent, uh, et cetera, both in terms of its uh, human rights conduct and also in terms of uh, its uh, sort of uh, uh, governance in general, I think that that's a key thing that maybe other people around the world also do not uh, appreciate as much uh, a vibrant uh, uh, civil society uh, that is also well-funded uh, 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 helps, uh, helps a great deal. Yes, and, and so um, I will mention that uh, Two weeks from, from from today, we will have so we will have a, a, of course a series next week, and then one uh, two weeks from from now. And in that final series, we will discuss a little bit more about the legal aspects. We didn't talk much today about how is you know Kosovo's government uh, composed and, and 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 you know the elections, but uh, you know are members of parliament elected and and what's the composition of that? Uh, but. Uh, just to add to that, of course, there's also the proportionality system, which was, which was pushed, which is, which is very, very important. Um, I think somebody else had a question, maybe, uh, maybe here, and then, and then let me. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm curious what five, or I think you said five EU countries don't recognize Kosovo. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and it's uh, it's one of the main stumbling blocks for uh, Kosovo's inability to achieve uh, 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 sort of uh, completely international uh, independence and uh, uh, to split paths entirely with Serbia as well. And those countries are Spain, uh, Greece, Romania, Slovakia, and Cyprus. Four of, uh, four of them are also NATO members. Now the reason why they do not uh, uh, recognize Kosovo has to do with this parallel making Right, that we were talking about uh, sometimes false parallel making. Right, they, uh, some of them see Kosovo as potentially a bad precedent for uh, 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 independence movements that they have within their own countries. Like think of Catalonia in Spain, although there's uh, significant differences. Right, because Kosovo was uh, uh, stems from uh, a country that is now defunct. Right, that was div dissolved into its composite parts. That's not necessarily the case with. Uh, uh, Spain or some of the other countries. Some of the other countries also have, uh, might have uh, some cultural and diplomatic affinities with Serbia, which uh, 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 you know have prevented them. Although some are moving in the direct right direction, uh, uh, especially with Greece more recently, uh, uh, but also Slovakia, I think uh, as well. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, this lack of recognition by the uh, five EU countries has significantly weakened uh, uh, the US and EU, European Union leverage towards uh, Serbia with regard to its role in Kosovo because uh, um, one of the best carrots that the uh, West has in terms of inducing Serbia to be a more cooperative actor uh, uh, in general in the region but particularly uh, uh, with Kosovo is, you know, the prospect of eventually joining the European Union, right? And uh, so long as we have these non-recognizers, right, uh, uh, the Kosovo's own path towards uh, joining the EU can uh, uh, seem a little bit more uh, uh, complicated as well. And so, and it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, one of the main uh, U.S. Uh, strategies in uh, in, in uh, the Balkans, which is uh, you know the, the complete resolution of this Kosovo question uh, through achievement of its independence, is being held back a little bit by these by the short-sightedness of uh, some of these countries. Yes, another question. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was wondering about what Kosovo's current relationship with uh, international organizations like NATO, the EU, the UN look like, or if they're on the path towards membership with any of those groups? Great. 
as a former diplomat, do you want to answer that? Or <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm here. I'm, no, no, you're, you're you're the one answering questions. I'm um, I'm only here to pose questions. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, Kosovo um, is a member of several different and important international organizations. Uh, had the easiest time joining international organizations where the U.S. has a particularly strong say. So the World Bank, IMF, the uh, uh, the path towards joining those institutions was fairly easy, right? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a member of uh, several regional organizations as well, and it has a relationship uh, and contractual re relationship now with the EU as well, right? But it's very early, uh, uh, it's very early in uh, the process. Uh, Kosovo would like to be uh, a member of, uh, uh, you know, other important international organizations, including uh, uh, the Council of Europe, which it put which it fulfills the criteria for. I mean, democracy is uh, one of the main criteria there, even though you have countries uh, uh, that are not uh, entirely democratic. Uh, and, uh, you know, many other international organizations, obviously the UN, but that's, uh, that's gonna be very difficult with uh, uh, the intransigent uh, uh, role that uh, Serbia and uh, its ally Russia uh, uh, plays in that regard. Uh, but that's also very, uh, in, in, it's a good question for uh, uh, another important reason, and that's that uh, um, to be in a member of the current international uh, community, right, you need to be a part of uh, uh, as many international organizations as possible, and especially if you buy into the, the US-led uh, international order, which has been, uh, uh, created since the end of World War II and particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, obviously Kosovo uh, aspires to do that. Uh, there's uh, uh, still some more work to be done. Unfortunately, much of it does not depend on uh, uh, Kosovo per se, but on the external actors. Yes, indeed, and, uh, and, and so uh, Kosovo did formally submit its uh, request to join, for example, the Council of Europe, but now there are also, for your information, diplomatic efforts um, uh, led by the EU through a Franco-German proposal, supported, strongly supported by the US, to settle uh, disputes between uh, Kosovo and Serbia and to have an agreement which is, is going to be a pre-full normalization agreement, so this is not going to be the full normalization agreement, and uh, that means that some countries, uh, even you know, um, in the West, hesitate to support uh, Kosovo's uh, membership at the moment by saying, well, we want you to you know, come up with some agreement so that uh, the path is going to be smoother. Uh, so we have time for one final uh, question, and I think it's the gentleman over there. Thank you guys for doing this talk. You. So you alluded to that one of the reasons the transition from the peaceful resistance to the actual armed conflict was the failure of Kosovo to be included in the Dayton Accords. Looking at Bosnia now and the kind of gridlock that has developed in the failure of them to advance uh, their democracy, do you think Kosovo in this new proposal with the Serbian regions um, can avoid the problems that the Dayton Accords have kind of given Bosnia? Do you think it was actually better for the fact that Kosovo didn't kind of fall under that same structure and design? No, oh, that's a very Thank smart you. question. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, on the one hand, uh, Kosovo's inability to uh, attract uh, international attention during that time was a failure, right? And uh, a failure also of the international diplomacy in that regard. Uh, more so than you know the the, the nonviolent peaceful uh, movement, uh, the but it is also uh, correct uh, I believe to uh, say as you imply that uh, the Dayton uh, uh, peace accords, while they were successful at ending the violence and the war, uh, they were. Uh, not so successful and created the seeds of uh, uh, future problems uh, for Bosnia. Now to just uh, contextualize this discussion for the rest of the audience, what happened was that in Bosnia, they, created, they decided in order to end the war, they decided to uh, create a territorially and ethnically heavily decentralized federation 
that primarily uh, uh, Serbia asked for in order to end uh, the war, right? And so I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that one of the, big, uh, one of the biggest problems for Kosovo and the region, even during Yugoslavia, was Serbia's strategy and its sort of uh, strategic culture to uh, remain the regional hegemon, right? And they tried to do that prior to Yugoslavia. They did it uh, during Yugoslavia as well by basically wanting to call the shots, right? And when Yugoslavia failed, right, they tried to do that through war. And when war failed, they tried to do that through devising institutional structures, right, like decentralized and uh, autonomous entities in Bosnia, uh, like Republika Srpska, where even though they no longer control these countries uh, 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 legally, right? Uh, there are elements, political and institutional elements within these countries. And mind you, this is also something that uh, Russia uh, uh, tried to do in Ukraine prior to uh, the war as well, um, uh, to sort of like create these different countries uh, uh, and influence their foreign policy, their uh, uh, local policy as well, through the Serbian communities within those countries. Right, and so that's sort of the, the big problem with uh, Bosnia in particular, where they created this uh, uh, inf institutional infrastructure that did help end the war, right? Uh, but then created a very dysfunctional uh, 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 political and administrative uh, system that also allows Serbia to be uh, a key actor in uh, in Bosnian politics as well. And unfortunately, I think that this is where, this is the point that uh, the international community does not fully understand, uh, uh, and this is what I think uh, you know, they're trying to do in Kosovo uh, as well through these, uh, uh, the, the latest talk that you were uh, uh, alluding uh, to as well. Because the international community is very good at understanding uh, um, diplomacy when you're dealing with actors whose strategic culture is the same as most countries in the West. And what do I mean by strategic culture? I mean uh, ways of engaging in politics and foreign policy where you pursue your interests, your security uh, uh, through particular kinds of ways which are usually transactional, right, value-based, based on international institutions, et cetera. If you're dealing with a type of strategic culture where foreign policy uh, uh, and your attitude towards cooperation and conflict is entirely different, is based on you know, trying to achieve hegemony through ideational and identity uh, variables uh, 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 like sort of uh, Serbia does with Bosnia and with Kosovo, that's an entirely different way of doing things. Uh, 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 and uh, oftentimes I fear that, uh, 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 you know, the diplomats who are engaged in uh, uh, even the current uh, round of diplomacy fail to see that part, right? Why is Serbia insisting ab uh, about uh, autonomy of the northern municipalities, right? Or of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 the municipal the uh, autonomy for uh, the Serbian municipalities in Kosovo is that because it really wants the uh, the Serbian minority in Kosovo to uh, you know have more rights and freedoms uh, uh, because it, I should note that uh, you know Kosovo's constitution grants uh, uh, you know the, the Serbian minority with quite a a, a long list of uh, freedoms and. Uh, and or is that because it wants to create sort of like the type of structures that it did in Bosnia that, that can, you know, sow more discontent and dysfunction, et cetera, uh, in the future as well. And I think we have to be uh, particularly alert about this uh, 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 moving forward as well as those uh, latest talks uh, are wrapping up. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, maybe um, two last remarks. Uh, one on the U.S.-Kosovo uh, relations, which we did not really uh, uh, discuss uh, as I wanted to, but uh, we're here at the Bob Dole Institute, which is a uh, bipartisan institute, and Kosovo and the United States 
have uh, this relationship which is based on, uh, on here on a bipartisan uh, uh, support, which is very important for, for Kosovo. And the second is regarding the photos that uh, you're seeing. Again, I would like to call your attention. On the right, you have, you have a, a drawing uh, done by a young uh, Kosovo refugee. And uh, on the left, uh, you have the same Kosovo refugee uh, uh, who has become now uh, a famous uh, contemporary young artist called Petri Tadilai, whom I know personally and who has, you know, who has been at uh, MoMA, at Tate in London and all over the world. So, um, so I think the message uh, from Kosovo is also a message of hope and a message of friendship. And uh, I would like to thank you very much, Palum, for, for sharing some of your story, for sharing your thoughts, uh, and for, you know, for having in mind the fact that you, know, you have also mathematicians in the audience. So thank you for not you know, being too technical. I would like to thank you all for your presence here and all of those that join us online. Uh, and I would like to invite you to join us again next week when uh, we will have um, a former president of Kosovo, Yahyaga, joining us to uh, continue our discussion on uh, building democracy in the 21st century, focusing on Kosovo. So thank you again, and uh, we're happy to continue uh, speaking with you after this is over. Thank you. Thank you so much.